If you haven't already seen on my Instagram and TikTok on the 14th of December at 1.03 p.m., I gave birth to a beautiful little boy that we named Hunter William Hampton, and we are so happy to have him as part of our family. And today I'm gonna to be taking you through my labor and birth story time. Now, a quick little disclaimer. If you are someone who is currently pregnant, I'm probably going to recommend that you don't watch this video. One of the things that really sort of triggered me or I found annoying while I was pregnant is everyone deciding that that was a great time for them to give me all of their horror birth stories and it wasn't really helpful. Um, and so I don't want to do that to you. So if you are pregnant and you choose to continue watching you are doing so at your own discretion and for everyone else there is going to be a lot of talk about like different bodily parts and functions and gross things so just keep that in mind as well but if you're keen to hear my labor and birth story grab yourself a cuppa and let's get into the video It is Saturday the 9th of December and this is the belly at this point. I feel like it did drop a lot in the last week, but it's kind of risen sort of back up again since then. But I have been definitely getting more uh, Braxton Hicks contractions on a daily basis and like a feeling of kind of tenderness and period pain as well sort of in my lower pelvis area so i'm hoping that these are good signs that things are going to start happening for us soon Alrighty, so we are going to start off at around five o'clock on wednesday evening the 13th of december at that point i had just stood up from laying down and walked around to my side of the bed and I had already been suspecting that like either my waters had broken slightly or that they were going too soon but I knew when I got this big trickle of water down my leg and onto the carpet that things were actually happening. So I promptly made my way to the bathroom um, where another big gush <laughs> just blurted out on the bathroom floor. Um, I had equipped myself with a whole heap of extremely large and overwhelming pads. And I put one of those on and literally it had been on for like maybe two minutes. And you know when you're blowing a bubble and that bubble just like pops and it makes a popping sound? It was honestly like that. I felt like a kind of pop and like a popping sound and all of a sudden a big like wash of amniotic fluid just came out. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is really happening. So at that point, um, the cramps started coming on pretty instantaneously. They weren't bad, it was just like a dull kind of ache feeling in um, my lower abdomen, but they really did start increasing um, pretty quickly. Uh, I went on TikTok and literally the first video that came up was about like the initial stations, stages of labor. And it said that the toilet is the dilation station so it's the perfect place to sit when your waters are broken and to help the process of dilation and i honestly just thought that like when your waters break it would just all come out i or like even if it was going to come out over time that that time wouldn't be a long period of time i was really wrong so i I followed this little TikTok's advice. I sat down on the toilet backwards, actually, so that I could kind of hunch over the cistern if I needed to like have a place to rest. And I was listening to the Girls Next Level podcast just as something to kind of focus on other than what was going on in my body. But I was like going in and out of like delirium and exhaustion and whatever so it was kind of not 100 percent present for that um, and the whole time that i'm on there is just like the amniotic fluid is just continually pumping out and i'm like oh my gosh when is this stuff gonna drain how much was in there honestly it's something i didn't really realize going into uh, labor is 
how long it takes for the amniotic fluid to come out sometimes. Um, and I was on there for like what could have been hours because I was listening to a podcast that was at least an hour long and I was maybe watching a few YouTube videos as well. And over that point in time, the period like cramps had started becoming contractions. I moved off the toilet. I was attempting to watch um, The Born Identity. I don't know how much, if any, of that movie I got in. I was trying to do a little bit of child's pose on the bed to kind of like help me relax, get baby in position, help me breathe deeper. Um, and then the contractions were picking up. I know that we needed to wait until I was about four centimeters dilated before we went to the hospital. That's what the midwives um, asked of us, just so that we weren't waiting around there for long periods of time. And they did suggest that laboring at home for as long as possible was the best scenario because in your own environment, you're going to be a lot more calmer. And in being calmer, it's going to help that sort of dilation process speed up. So all the while that I was on the toilet and then moving to bed to do my stretches and attempts to watch this movie, I had my phone going on timer. I didn't download a contraction timer. Um, I'm sure I could have. I don't know if there are any free ones, but I wasn't certainly wasn't going to pay for one. So I just did like a, a timer on my phone and every time I had a contraction, I just pressed the lap button. And initially they were kind of like all over the place. Like sometimes they'd be five minutes apart, six minutes apart, nine minutes apart, but then it started to get more and more consistent um, and was like consistently around the five minute mark for a while, then the four minute mark for a while. And I was just like, how do we know whether we're um, three, three or four centimeters dilated? How do we know? And they said, if you're having um, one minute long contractions, three in the space of 10 minutes for like a consistent period of time. So like an hour or something, that's sort of a, a sign that you might be at that stage. So we're waiting around his home for as long as possible and kind of got to that stage where it was those consistent, pretty well three minutes apart. And it had been like that for quite some time. At this point, it's 11 o'clock. So we've gone from five to 11. So four hours of just like cramping, amniotic fluid coming out, slowly building up contractions. Now the hospital that we needed to go to is actually an hour away. So at 11, Dave rings the hospital. He tells them that we're coming up and we get in the car to drive. I already had um, baby's car seat, stroller, baby bag packed. I had um, our hospital bag packed, but there were just like a few clothing and toiletry items that I hadn't put in previously that while my, you know, cramps and contractions were not that bad, I was prepping. Um, I just wanted to wait until the moment of to sort of get those finalized because I just didn't know when it was going to happen. So this is the 13th and he wasn't due until the 18th. Um, so we get in the car and start driving up there. My contractions are pretty bad at that point. And being in the car and having that hour long drive was just so painful, so frustrating. I just wanted to get there. It was late at night at this point. I was tired. We had to stop for roadworks. There was a stop, like a stoplight. And we'd stop there for quite some time. And when we finally like are making our way through the roadworks, nothing's happening. No one's working. And so that was just like, oh my gosh, like we just want to get there safely, by the way. So I'm praying in the car on the way up that we can have a safe drive up and everything will be safe and calm and peaceful when we get up there. So we get up there about 12, make our way into the maternity and birthing suites pretty much straight away. They just um, take us straight into a room. They had one um, free, which was fantastic. Um, and at that point, my contractions were pretty bad. 
um, we were met with a midwife. She seemed really nice and she was kind of, you know, helping us along. She's like, at this point, I'm not going to do um, an exam on you to see how far dilated you are um, because we want to limit the amount of times we need to do that for kind of like health bacteria infection type reasons. And she's like, and you probably don't want to know the answer at this point because it'll likely discourage you. Um, so I'm like, oh great. Um, it wasn't long that we were there and I was having my contractions that I'm like, I need some pain relief. I called her in because she wasn't like hanging around the whole time. She was kind of giving us a bit of privacy and, and Dave was there like squeezing my hips from the back every time I had a contraction to try and help with the pain. And I'm like, please, like I need some pain relief. I'm just like, what do you want? Like we can do gas, we can do morphine, we can do, you know, whatever. And I'm like, let's just try out the gas so far. So um, she had the machine there, set that up and, and showed me how to use it. And I found the gas machine like really disconcerting because when you breathe in, you have to do so at like a depth where it made the machine make a rattling sound. And when you heard the rattling sound, you knew that you were getting enough gas, but the rattling sound was just like really disturbing. So every time it happened, I'm like, oh my gosh. And if it didn't make enough of a rattle, like it would just work me up even more. Um, so I was there with Dave having my contractions, taking the gas for, I don't know how long, it was maybe only half an hour or so and I'm like I was sweating like a fiend and I was just in pain so they have um they have the birthing room they have a store room which has like a whole heap of different equipment you can use and they also have a bathroom which has a toilet shower and really big bath in it so I took myself into the bathroom Dave was having a lie down on the lounge that was in there um and I just turned on the shower stripped down turned on the shower I like my showers nice and hot and just having the heat, having the pressure of the shower on me felt, well, pretty good, as, as good as you can kind of get in this situation. So I was standing under the shower for like maybe, it felt like an hour. I honestly felt so bad that I was wasting water, but it was just the only thing that could somewhat comfort me at that point. Um, but, Contractions had ramped up significantly by then. And um, there was a, like a chair next to the shower. So every time I would have a contraction, I'd be like hunching over the chair and just like making these like really guttural, moaning, kind of disturbing wildebeest type noises. Um, and then after being in the shower for like an hour, so we're at 1.30 now, um, I had to call the lady in again. I'm like, okay, because the gas was on a machine. So that was hooked up near the bed out in the other room. So I didn't have any pain relief while I was in there. So I call her in, I'm like, I think I need the portable gas machine. She's like, would you like to take a bath as well? I'm like, okay, I'll give it a crack. She's like, it takes a while to um, fill up. Like this is a ginormous bath, almost like a small swimming pool or a spa or something. Um, so she's filling up the bath for me. She brings in the portable gas machine. I'm just like still there in the shower. Um, after quite some time, the bath fills up. I hop in, I'm like slumped over the bath with the gas machine, like just sucking in like an absolute fiend every time I have a contraction. Most of the time, I like sometimes I was slumped over this way, like over the edge of the bath, sort of hunched like that. Sometimes I was kind of reclined with my knees up. Um, I felt like even though the bath was soothing in a way and I honestly don't even know if the gas did anything other than like help me breathe. Um, I don't know, I couldn't really tell you like on a scale how much actual pain relief it provided me, but just 
the, I guess, mental sort of situation of me having the contraction and breathing it in like helped. Even if it was just the placebo effect, it helped. Now, what I found particularly painful was my back. I was having back contractions and my lower back was in absolute agony. And so it honestly didn't matter whether I was slumped over the bath, whether I was reclined in the bath, no position was providing my back any sort of relief. I had been in there, I thought I had been in the bath for maybe an hour or two. I pressed the button for her again. I'm like, I was exhausted at this point. I was, I'd been up for all day, <laughs> you know, since seven o'clock that morning, I'd been up all day. Um, I'd been laboring for, you know, a couple of hours uh, with quite bad contractions at this point. Um, and I, I just, I was knackered, I was out of it. I didn't really want to have an epidural. Like I was open to it, but I kind of had like a, a flow chart, if you will, of like, first I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this. Um, and the very last resort that I wanted to get to was a C-section. I really wanted to try and avoid that if possible because I just did not want to add an extra layer of recovery on top of everything else and looking after a newborn. So epidural for me was kind of down there, but above C-section, but I got to that point. Physically, I got to that point. Mentally, I got to that point. Emotionally, I got to that point. I'd been like crying, sobbing, just like out of it. So I call her in, I'm like, I need an epidural. She's like, okay, now just so you know, like we need to call the guy. He has to live like within a certain um, radius of the hospital. So he might not be here at the moment. He might be treating someone else at the moment. He might be at home on call, um, but it could take a while for him to get here. We also need to prep you. Um, she's like, let me just do a, a physical exam. Um, Cause at that point I hadn't had one and it had been hours. So I thought, okay, for sure. I'm at like six or seven centimeters. I've reached my crisis of conflict, you know, my crisis point. Um, surely I'm that far along. Now I was in the bath when she did the exam. So, you know, there is like a little bit of a margin for error because it's hard to sort of get where you need to go and, and feel around in the water. But she's like, look, you're at five centimeters. And I was so disappointed. I was so discouraged. Um, I, I thought for sure that I was way further along than that. Um, and I knew in myself that there was no way I was going to get the next five centimeters on my own with just the gas. I was just, I'd reached the end of my rope essentially. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Call him, get the guy. She's like, all right, you need to get out of the bath. So I got out of the bath, made my way to the bed. Dave was awake at that point, told him I was getting an epidural. I think he was trying to encourage me to like, you're doing great, like keep going. Um, but I just knew in myself like, yeah, I'd reached that point. And I kind of like, in a sense, felt like I was giving up because I didn't want to reach that point. But if I could go back, I probably would have let myself just give myself a little bit of grace and let myself reach that conclusion a smidge bit earlier because I, by the time I got the epidural, I was so tired and I think I'd really depleted a lot of resources that I was going to need later. Now, like I said, I thought I was only in the bath slash shower for a couple of hours. We're at 1.30 when I moved into the bathroom. I thought like maybe it was three o'clock, perhaps 3.30, four o'clock at the latest. I ask her what the time is or Dave or I don't know. I don't know who I'm talking to at this point or what I'm saying or what's going on around me. It's 5.30. So I had been struggling physically and emotionally in that bloody bathroom by myself for four hours. Um, no wonder I was so exhausted. 
So anyway, they're prepping me. They had to put a cannula in my hand so that they could hook me up to an IV. They had to like get the site all ready. They had to obviously call him and wait for him to get there. And I think it was maybe by the time all of that had been done and he actually got there and I got the epidural, it was probably about 6.30. So it had taken an hour for all of the prep and everything to happen. Now, the reason why I was so concerned about, not concerned, well, had reservations, I guess, about getting an epidural is I thought, you know, that it was gonna be this massive long needle, which Dave kind of tells tells me that it was but I didn't see it so I don't know how long it was um, I thought that it was gonna be painful I thought that you know I might move accidentally during the insertion process and that that was going to basically paralyze me um, which it possibly could have I don't know if I had have moved in any case I was in that much agony and they had me slumped a certain way like over different pillows and everything so that they could guide the needle and and all the, the bits and bobs in i honestly did not feel a thing um they put in a like a an anesthetic beforehand to kind of like help me not feel a thing i suppose so i literally did not feel a thing which was one thing that i'd be worried about i thought that it would be painful i thought that i would feel it i thought that like once they lied me laid me down that i would feel it and like know that there was something happening there honestly did not it took maybe half an hour for that to kick in so we're at 7 a.m at this point so during that period of time when it hadn't kicked in, whenever I would get a contraction, I would just be taking the gas. Um, so by the time it did kick in, however, it was so good. I could feel like a tightening or a slight pressure whenever I was getting a contraction, like I'd know, oh, I'm getting a contraction now, but all of the pain associated with the contraction in my um, uterus or in my back was completely gone. And I really needed that because it was the first time that I was able to have a rest. So at this point, we had a shift change with the nurses and the one that I had previously had, you know, gone off, logged off or whatever, clocked off. And I had two other girls come in and they were kind of like getting caught up with things. They positioned me in like a nice little spot, got me all like rugged up and set up and just said, look, just have a rest. So from seven till 10, I just sort of slept and rested and it was so good. It was definitely what my body and my mind needed. At about 10 o'clock, they came in and they did another um, examination and they're like, look, I think you're you're either nine centimeters or like maybe even 10 centimeters. So we're kind of like getting ready to go. We're gonna give you an hour to make sure that you reach that 10 centimeters, like make sure baby can kind of like fully come down into like the fullest of positions. Um, and then after that hour is up, we're gonna start pushing. Um, so I'm just sort of there like doing my thing at that point, just like, letting it all kind of flow down and then they come back in at about well i dave thinks it might have been about 10 30. He, he thinks it was like a little bit earlier than my timeline but let's just say 10 30 11 o'clock they come back in and they're like, all right it's pushing time now um whenever you feel a contraction coming on we want you to take like a big deep breath in and then quick one out in out quick one out in and whenever I'm like just like focus on the zone down there um, and on pushing out and so I did that and they helped me do that in a couple of positions they helped me do that on my back with my legs up and my knees sort of scrunched in um, they helped me do it on my side uh, it kind of felt like on my side was maybe like a little bit more comfortable but on my back was a little bit more effective in any case i was like really struggling to get 
um, the breathing pattern down pat because like I'd want to breathe out more slowly like I find it hard to swim and hold my breath while I'm swimming and so like having the big breath in quick out suck enough in to like have the strength to push um, was really hard and also I, I found it difficult to focus on the specific zone that I needed to be directing my pushing towards and I don't know that it, I was like fully capitalizing on that so uh, here I am struggling like for a good while of me pushing I felt like it was honestly doing nothing and we weren't seeing any progress um, after about like maybe an hour of pushing I was starting to get the hang of it a little bit more and then the obstetrician came in and she just wanted to do a check see what was kind of happening um, and she's and the nurses were like oh we've been pushing for about an hour now like we're not seeing too much progress and the obstetrician was saying well you know if in the next hour we're not seeing much progress um, we might need to consider using some tools like forceps, vacuum or cesarean. And I'm like, no, I don't want a C-section. And I think the reason why she was so concerned and Dave's like, this is a big part of the story, Carly. You need to make sure that you tell this part of the story is that there had been a couple of instances where his heart rate had dropped significantly. So they had me hooked up, but they also had this big band around my belly to monitor his heartbeat. Um, and there was one time where the nurses noticed it dropped and they pushed the emergency button and like all of these people, random people just start coming in and like looking and checking and checking to see his heart rate and all of these things and they're like oh no okay it's gone back up again don't know what happened there it was probably just during a contraction and he was a bit stressed out and then there was another time where the midwives weren't in the room I don't know if they were like maybe having their morning tea break or like it was during the time when we were just sort of letting the you know 10 centimeters fully happen but dave was looking at the monitor and his heart rate dropped to something like 58 um when it should have been like over a hundred and dave like quickly pressed the emergency button and once again everyone come in and i think it might have even happened like another time where his heart rate dropped again, emergency button, all of these different people. So the midwives and the obstetrician at this point were a bit concerned of like having his heart rate drop so many different times. Like we really need to get him out. Carly's like struggling with the whole pushing thing at the moment that we're not seeing a lot of progress. Um, she's like, okay, I'm gonna give it a little bit of time. If we don't see progress, we need to, use these tools then i'm like yeah well let's use the vacuum then uh let's just get him out so closer to one o'clock she comes back in we're like yep yeah, we need to go we're going to get the vacuum on him uh had me sitting upright at this point and they're like push 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 they could see his head but he wasn't crowning at that point he was like maybe close to, um, he'd kind of come down the canal, but they say that it's like an S bend in the toilet and he needs to do some sort of turn. And like, that wasn't happening. I'd push, you'd see, you know, part of the head, but then when I'd like take a breath, it would, he would suck back in again. Like I wasn't applying that consistent pushing pressure to have him be moving you know, further down through the breath. So once she did see his head, she latched on and she started pulling him out. Um, and like the feeling was just so insane. Like the contractions were bad, but feeling him being suctioned out and his head coming out was hot and pressure 
and burning like they do call it the ring of fire typically like if you are not having an epidural it would probably like really hurt um it didn't hurt me that much obviously because i had the epidural but um i still felt all of the pressure when his head was halfway out or maybe his head was the full way out i'm not no his head was halfway out and he flatlined on the monitor they didn't get any heart rate at all and, and all of the nurses are like come on carly push and it just felt like It just felt like all of a sudden there was like a real urgency, like there was a big problem and I just needed to like get my, sorry. I just needed to get it together and like muster up something, any form of energy for those last minutes just to push. Say I did, I could feel him like slipping on out and he was thrown up against my chest it it like they're like it's a boy throw him up against my chest he it was really disturbing i thought it'd be fine it was really disturbing because he was so purple and just lifeless and floppy and he wasn't making any noise and they had him on my chest for literally two seconds before they just whisked him off and I didn't know what was happening. They have this little crib right next to the bed. They turn the lights on, like emergency button, all these people come in. Like at this point, there'd already been like maybe four different people in the room. And then another lady came in and they're like all gathered around this little bed and they're rubbing him and they're putting this like face mask on him. He still hadn't cried at this point. I don't know if he had even taken a breath at this point and I knew that they only have like 60 seconds after being born to start breathing and then after that I don't know if they're like pronounced or if the chances of survival significantly dip I don't know what the situation is I just knew that those 60 seconds mattered at that point, Dave was standing next to me and we were just holding hands, just really tight. And I could see that he was crying. And I was so out of it, but I was really stressed because I thought that he was dead. And I thought that I had had like these beautiful 10 months with him and that all of a sudden that that was going to be snatched away from me and I was counting I was like even counting out loud just waiting waiting to hear that cry waiting to hear something anything and they're like sucking mucus and gunk out of his mouth and then applying the the breathing mask again and then finally finally we hear it cry and i just felt such relief now at this point i was just so focused on him i didn't know that they actually had to to cut me in order to get him out um obviously like that was just fully the best decision like i needed him to be safe um so the obstetrician was still there and she like put the injection in me to deliver the placenta like that 
just came out so easy. She just put it in straight away, like pulled, yanked it out. It was gross. Um, and then she was there sort of stitching me up the whole time, Dave and I are just looking over at this bed, just watching him, watching as they, um, they're working on him. Like I've missed so many different things as I'm telling this story. Like I've realized two things I've missed. Thing number one I missed is at some point while I'm pushing, like I'm not feeling the contractions anymore. So I don't know when to push. The only way I knew when to push is I'm listening to his heart monitor. And when I hear it start picking up, I know that there's a contraction on the way and I know that I need to push. So they actually had to put me on like another IV and insert like the synthetic hormone that they normally use for um, inductions in order to ramp up my contractions so that I can actually feel them again. So that's point number one I missed. Second point I missed is that when they delivered him, he had poo. Now, typically doing a poo in the womb is a sign that the baby is in distress. And obviously the fact with his heart rate dropping so many times and him flatlining like upon like being birthed, he was in distress. But thankfully they got him breathing over there. I delivered my placenta, Dave and I were like, still like very heightened and very stressed and worried, but like, so much more relieved because obviously he's alive. Um, at this point, the obstetrician is starting to stitch me up from the cut that she had to make um, to be able to get him out. And the nurses are like saying, okay, we need to take him to the nursery. We need to put him on like all of these different things to monitor him, give him some more air bubbles, different things like that. Um, is that all right? And I'm like, obviously, like, take him, please, like, help him. So they wheel him out, and I'm like, Dave, I need you to go with him. And I feel like Dave kind of felt like a bit conflicted because he could see me there. I was, I'd gone through an ordeal. I was in physical pain. I was getting stitched up. I was very worried, and he wanted to be there to support me, but also obviously wanted to just make sure that Hunter was okay. And I'm like, I need you to go with him. So Dave went with him. So this is one o'clock. One o'clock, he was birthed. Um, I get stitched up. After they stitch me up um, and they kind of like clean the room, clean me down, um, take out the epidural. Um, my mum and dad arrive, which was good. It was nice to have them there and like have a comforting figure because at that point, Dave had gone with Hunter and I was alone in the room and feeling, I feel like I wasn't upset at that point because I was just like high on so much adrenaline and my, I was like feeling so delusional, like I didn't have any awareness to even be upset. And when they came in and I started relaying like exactly what happened to them, I think that's when I started to get a little bit more emotional and we were hoping that they would be able to see him in the nursery as well. Um, so at that point, it had actually been two hours. It was three o'clock and I'd finally been, you know, had all the things taken off me, um, taken off the IV, cleaned up, put in a wheelchair and I was finally going to see Hunter in the nursery. It, it makes me really sad not only to think about what he went through, but also to think about what I went through and what I missed out on. Like it was really important to me that we have delayed cord clamping 
immediate skin to skin one hour uninterrupted uninterrupted like that golden hour time where we could just be together and bond as a family and like all of that was taken from me and I was sitting like virtually alone or like sometimes there'd be a nurse in a room by myself for two hours just wondering how my son was doing if he was okay and when I finally was getting wheeled to see him that's when the emotion kicked in and I'm being wheeled out my parents are waiting there for their turn to be able to go into the nursery and see him because they weren't allowed to go in there before me like it needed to be me first and have that time with him first which makes sense and by the time they wheeled me like past my parents I am bawling my eyes out and they're like what's wrong are you okay and I'm like I'm just so excited to see him and then when we get to the nursery like Dave sees me I'm like fully like almost hysterically crying and he's freaking out thinking what the hell's wrong and I virtually said the same thing I just want to see my boy and they had him hooked up like all these things on him a big mask on him with tubes everywhere it was so disturbing to see so sorry They took him off all the things because at this point he was breathing okay but he still had like all of these cords and like a thing down his throat that they had to pull out and they passed him to me and he was cry 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 but then once he got to me and I like started saying it's mummy and talking to him that's when he stopped crying we were able to look at each other and I was able to hold him it was, it was very emotional but very beautiful at the same time and from there they helped me to breastfeed like both sides which like is a whole another situation story I was able to do it <laughs> um, somewhat successfully I suppose considering it was my first time but just having that time with us together and one of the nurses she was so nice she had um, while I was in the room she said do, do you have your phone I'll go in and I'll see Dave and Hunter and I'll take some photos and she went in and she took some photos for me while they were in the nursery and while I was in the room and then when we first when I first met him I suppose when I was breastfeeding him, she was there taking heaps of photos and videos for me as well. And I'm really thankful for that because now I've got those. I mean, like, it's sad. It's a sad memory to look back on. But it's happy too because we got him and he's okay. Now, unfortunately, my parents weren't allowed to come in and see him. I think, like, just because of the whole ordeal and, like, the state that I was in and everything one of the nurses just said I don't think it's a good idea at this point so anyway they left but Dave and I were able to have like a really good chunk of time with him like maybe an hour with him and um, at that point um, they wheeled me to my room or maybe Dave did I don't even know I'm so delusional um, Dave wheeled me to my room so you have like the birthing suites and then once you're done you go to a, another room. Unfortunately there had been so many births that I wasn't able to have a room to myself so there were curtains so it kind of shut off different sections but there was already a lady with a baby in one part of it and then we kind of like hung out there together. I was really tired. I was in pain um, but at about five o'clock he had to go because the dog had been at home 
by himself all night. We just wanted to make sure that he was okay. Um, he was pretty stressed while I was laboring at home. He knew that something was wrong and he knew that his mum was in pain and I think felt bad about that. So Dave wanted to get home to him and obviously it was gonna be a full hour drive. So he left me um, and I was just, once again, alone in the room. I felt I felt very alone, I guess, that afternoon and that evening. Um, and that there was a hospital policy that um, the dads aren't allowed to stay over. There was no like beds or anything sort of set up for them. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, he couldn't stay. And there was like another person in the room anyway. So um, he had to leave. I was knackered. So from, I, they brought in some food for me. I was able to like have some sort of dinner, which was great because I hadn't eaten since um, dinner the night before at like maybe five o'clock. So it had been a full 24 hours since I'd eaten. Um, and so I ate my dinner. I was trying to stay awake and watch a YouTube video, but I was so knackered, I fell asleep. When I woke up at seven o'clock, they had wheeled Hunter in and they had him in like a little crib all wrapped up next to me and it was the first time since like three o'clock, since the first time I saw him that I was able to see him again. And you know, all the tubes and pads and different things were removed from him. He was just sleeping. Obviously he was really tired. It had been a pretty hectic experience for him. So he just slept for a while. I did ask them to save our placenta. Um, I don't want to eat it or make capsules out of it or anything like that. But um, my sister-in-law told me that in um, Aboriginal culture, it's like women's business to go to a special spot after the baby is born and bury the placenta there. And like that will be their spot and kind of a significant place for them. And you do it with like the significant women in your family. So. It is currently chilling in my freezer until I am ready to uh, make that trek, but it will definitely be up at Greenfields Beach, not on the beach in the sand. Um, it'll be like in the reserve park, sort of park area, bush area. Um, that's where Dave and I got married. It's also where we took um, some maternity pictures with Hunter. So I feel like it's very special to me and definitely Jervis Bay is special to both Dave and I and hopefully it will be special to him one day as well. So that kind of brings us to the end of my labor and birth story. I actually have next video coming up, virtually what happens the 24 hours after that point. So it's the first 24 hours at home with Hunter, what Dave and I are getting up to, um, our challenges, what's my thoughts, my feelings, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a vlog. So that's actually, I'm recording this like one week after he was born and that is happening, you know, straight away after he's born. So we're not kind of chronological here in terms of real time filming, but I wanted to make sure the labor and story time was up first so that you are getting the full context and full picture prior to seeing us come home. Um, so I'm really sorry about those like intense emotional kind of crying moments. Obviously it was a very triggering experience for me and whenever i think back to that moment that he was placed on top of me and those moments where he was not breathing in the little crib situation there i i still get like very teary and emotional about it even one week after and i probably will forever i just think it's a miracle that we were able to conceive him a miracle that he's here with us today and I just feel so blessed and lucky to have him and to have Dave and for us to be a little family. So thank you for hanging out with me for the past however long. Um, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe down below. I put out new videos every single week. With that being said, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye guys.